How's it going, everybody? Very nice to be here. Um, my name is John Lilich. I work for a company called Consensus, and we work um, uh, on something called the blockchain. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, here today. Um, I guess perhaps some of you or many of you have heard about the blockchain or uh, some discussions about Bitcoin or some of these other things. And uh, just to give a quick kind of like overview, um, uh, there's some historical context here. Basically, um, in the early 50s, American corporations started adopt computers and started using computers in their business processes. And very quickly, um, into the 60s, they started basically having a whole bunch of data and they needed to figure out how to make the data structured, how to query the data, how to usefully interact with it. And this gave rise to the notion of the database. Um, and then pushing into the 70s and 80s, uh, there was demand to sort of connect all these different databases so they could talk to each other. Um, and this gave rise to the notion of the network. And basically on top of this construct, we started to build applications that now sort of look like the modern internet. Um, but the database and the network have always been sort of separate entities. Um, what the blockchain fundamentally does is it takes the database and the network and it makes them coterminous, where they're sort of one. Um, in the case of something like Bitcoin um, or Ethereum, we have uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of nodes uh, all over the world, so computers that are participating in the network, and all of them have the exact same copy of the state of the network. And at predictable intervals, um, in the case of Bitcoin, every 10 minutes. In the case of Ethereum, roughly every 15 seconds. They agree on the state of the network, so they achieve consensus, and they publish that. Um, and so every you know, 15 seconds in Ethereum, there's a new block that basically describes the state of the network, and over time, you have this sort of chain of blocks, and that's kind of what we call the blockchain. Um, these are some properties within the blockchain that are particularly interesting and um, can elegantly express themselves across a variety of sectors in a number of different business processes. Um, most notably, transactions that occur across this network are immutable, meaning that they cannot be erased, they cannot be altered, and there is very strong cryptography inherent uh, to the system, making it uh, extremely secure. Um, these are just some more blockchain characteristics. Um, the other thing that's really useful to kind of consider here is this notion of decentralization. So um, with Ethereum in particular, um, and of course Bitcoin as well, there is no buddy that owns the network. Um, it's sort of everywhere and yet nobody owns it, if you will. Um, it's a distributed decentralized system. And on top of that, we can build business logic um, that doesn't necessarily need to have this sort of command and control client server architecture where somebody can arbitrarily um, basically do whatever they want. Um, that's not the case with these systems. Um, there's a few different kind of configurations, different types of blockchains. So there's, of course, the public network, which um, in the case of Ethereum is uh, eight months old. It's performing extremely beautifully. In the case of Bitcoin, it's, I guess, eight years old now. Um, anybody can interact with the public network. It is a permissionless, censorship-resistant system. Um, but then there's also private and consortium blockchains, and those are basically uh, systems that we build and others for, in particular, Fortune 500s, where they would like to learn more about Ethereum, more about smart contracts, more about the blockchain, but don't necessarily, um, in many instances, have the regulatory frameworks in place that allow them to interact with public networks. So we can create private sort of sandboxes, and basically what that means is they control the nodes within the network, but ultimately um, those private blockchains can connect to consortium blockchains, which means um, and ultimately to the public blockchain, so we can envision an ecosystem, um, an interconnected ecosystem of different blockchains. Um, I guess with respect to what we're doing with these guys, with RWE, with our colleagues, is basically building um, an interesting type of business logic, I guess, on top of the decentralizing physical infrastructure of the grid. And our really goal is to try to enable new types of uh, transactions to occur, such as peer-to-peer -peer trading of energy. Um, the initial sort of push is really focused on uh, prosumers, so people with generative capacity, consumers with generative capacity, um, who have photovoltaic systems and batteries, et cetera, wherein we sink into the smart meter and we uh, basically treat the smart meter as an oracle of truth, a source of uh, information. And if the prosumer generates a surplus, meaning they produce more energy than they consume, we can represent that with a digital token 
that can be effectively a digital asset and traded across this network um, in a sort of peer-to-peer -peer way. Uh, this is just kind of like a quick overview of sort of what that looks like. Um, and so going forward, uh, I guess from a high-level perspective, we think it's kind of interesting to explore what a decentralized energy grid could look like. Uh, we think it's interesting to explore what types of business logic we can build on top of that and, and how people potentially might interact uh, with, given the opportunity to basically um, be prosumers and kind of participate in this market um, in, in sort of new ways. Um, I guess it's also very important to mention that our thinking here is really driven by technology um, and economics. So uh, as many of you know, of course, the cost of photovoltaics, solar has dramatically declined, uh, thanks to our good friends in China, <laughs> who just decided to produce a whole bunch of solar panels. Um, and, and so we're kind of basically at price parity with coal, um, and that's a pretty significant milestone. Um, these things aren't really that expensive anymore. Um, beyond that, uh, as the physical infrastructure of the grid decentralizes, as consumers start to build in more generative capacity um, into their facilities, um, basically the nature of the grid starts to kind of change a little bit. So it's appropriate, perhaps, to start looking at new kinds of systems to elegantly describe what's happening in the real world. Um, so why the blockchain is useful in this context? Again, going back to what we were discussing earlier, it's decentralized, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's cryptographically secure. It is a far more secure IT infrastructure. Basically, the underpinnings of the blockchain um, can be described as this notion of public-private key pair infrastructure. And that's like old cypherpunk, you know, like cryptography and technology um, that's uh, far more secure than kind of like what we've got today, which is sort of like this uh, candy firewall ringed fence sort of exterior that protects soft GUI assets in the middle. And, you know, this kind of architecture routinely gets breached and lots and lots of valuable data, information, money, et cetera, is stolen. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard of, like, large corporations getting hacked and losing, I don't know, 50 million customer <laughs> credit cards or, um, uh, you know, banks getting hacked and losing $800 million. You know, these things happen all the time because the IT infrastructure is not really that secure. Um, the blockchain is a different story. Uh, we're using Ethereum in particular, and that's kind of, uh, I guess, what I really wanted to touch upon real quick is this notion of smart contracts. So being able to build business logic into, um, into the blockchain and have it execute accordingly, uh, basically as prescribed by the rules of the, of the contract. So we can take this complicated sort of paper process, inefficient sort of uh, ways of doing transactions, and make them much more automated, much more secure, auto, uh, verifiable, immutable, et cetera. Um, so I guess I'm kind of getting low on time. But, I don't know, Sam, any, any thoughts? Am I forgetting anything here? No, I think you've covered it all, John. Yeah. The, <laughs> even you zip through all of that very quickly. I think the one thing I would add, uh, and the thing that we're working very closely on, is we are doing two things. We are looking at both integrating the blockchain into our solution, but we want to build out solutions that have a very strong customer demand. And so this is the reason why we are running experiments and building MVPs, because we could, of course, just build a solution and show it to people and say, hey, look, we can connect A and B together, and they can do something. But if there's no customer demand and there's no traction, we have no scalability. And so this is the reason why we are, at the moment, trying to develop our MVPs and get a very, very clear view about what is the pain point for prosumers. Because a prosumer is, for us, the ultimate decentralized energy producer. And developing a product to serve that decentralized energy producer is critical to proving the full potential of the decentralized energy world. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. It's, it's also worth mentioning that some of our thinking uh, along the lines of what Sam is describing is really focused on kind of the social uh, competitive um, component, wherein we think people will participate in these markets uh, perhaps they'll be motivated by the ability to sort of generate revenue for themselves, but also to be able to say, hey, I am participating in, you know, this new kind of sharing economy. I'm mindful of um, being a sort of renewable energy pro prosumer. You know, this, these are the kinds of things I care about. Um, and so, you know, there's a kind of shift in sort of what's happening, and we're seeing the rise of the sharing economy all over the world. I mean, we've seen it for years now with uh, Airbnb and 
sort of Uber and platforms like that. So we think this maps on nicely, and we're excited about the uh, potential. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. Exciting stuff. What is the timeline of uh, bringing the MVP to something more commercially available and usable? How far is this to commercialization? Maybe you can both uh, answer from a different point of view. Well, I, I would just say from the perspective of Ethereum, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a few things to consider. Um, Ethereum has been public for like nine months now. The network is performing beautifully. It's still in its early phases. So there is a scalability roadmap. Um, currently, blockchains are not very fast at all. They can only sort of process a few transactions. Um, and thinking about Ethereum in the context of this like world computer, this shared IT infrastructure, as kind of version 1 or version 0 0.1 or something, um, it is sort of slow. And there is um, continued uh, research and development that will be going sort of forward over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, so you know, we do have to kind of take that into consideration. Uh, however, there's a, a tremendous mi mindshare all over the world, developer mindshare. There's a lot of people working on this project, and I think we'll continue to see uh, the, you know, accelerated pace of development. And very soon, um, Ethereum will get to a point where it scales to, to a place where it can credibly sort of be um, fast enough and capable of processing, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, for example. How do you see it? And Sam? in terms of our, specifically our MVP, where we actually want to truly deliver a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, we're currently in the phase of, of building our MVP, and we intend to, within the next two to three months, go into a field trial. So we will be connecting a number of, of prosumers with, with buyers of their energy and seeing how it works. And, 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 and through that, we will begin to understand how does the technology work. But more fundamentally, how do people want to interact with the blockchain? Do they care? Don't they care? Because as you've seen, it has a number of intrinsic capabilities that could be interesting, but we need to explore with them what of those capabilities are they interested in. And so that will be the, the starting point. And are you leading a team of internal software developers at RWE, or who's making this? Well, this, this, is, this is why we joined together with Consensus, because, of course, what we as RWE bring, you know, we are in the decentralized energy world. We understand. Notionally, I think we have a good grasp on what the energy world needs to look like, but of course, consensus. You are the technology We're team, the techies, and yeah. they are the economics team. Something like that. Okay, yeah. cool. cool. Great. Thank you very much, Thank John, you. for the insight. Thank you. We look forward to hear more from you soon. Thank you.